recording. Oh, right, <clears throat> and we are actually recording. So uh, <clears throat> it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Matthew Kennedy from the University of Waterloo. Uh, sub the title of his talk is Non-Cumulative Convexity. Thank you, and, and thanks for the invitation to, to speak at this conference. So the first thing I wanna say is that I'm, in, I'm interpreting Drury Arvison's space, I think in the same sense as Arvison. And what I'd like to talk about today is very closely related to Arvison's perspective. And if you remember, the first place that Arvison considered the Drury Arvison space was in his third paper on subalgebras of C star algebras. And so I'd like to look at things from, from this perspective. And towards the end of my talk, I'm gonna talk about some, uh, some of the geometric properties of, of the Drury Arvison space from the perspective of non-commutative convexity, which I'm gonna tell you about. So some history, um, first of all, just to, to establish some terminology, I'm gonna be talking about operator systems. So an operator system typically is a, a unital self-adjoint subspace of a C-star algebra. And Arvison was really the, the first person to consider operator systems systematically. And He's really viewing them as non-commutative analogs of function systems, or sometimes called Archimedean order unit spaces in the convexity literature. And these are the Bonnock spaces, which are categorically dual to compact convex sets. So this is the, this is the setting, for example, of classical Choquet theory, um, of classical convexity theory. And motivated by this perspective, Arvison introduced notions of uh, the Choquet boundary for an operator system. Uh, specifically, he conjectured the existence of, of, an, of a non-commutative Choquet boundary for operator systems. And this, this theme appeared through his three papers, subalgebras and C-star algebras, like I said, which appeared in 69, 72, and, and 98. And in 98, this was the paper where he introduced the Drury, or considered, I should say for the first time, the Drury Arvison space. Um, now, uh, so in a sense, Arvison was considering this, this categorical dual, this non-commutative analog of the categorical dual of a compact convex set. Uh, what Wittstock realized is that actually there's this nice geometric object, which is on the other side of the operator system. And he introduced the notion of a matrix convex set. Um, and so subsequently, uh, I, I think it's fair to say this didn't receive so much attention until Eccles and Winkler really uh, developed sort of a systematic theory of matrix convex sets, established sort of the basic results from convexity theory, established that they also held in this non-commutative context. And formerly Webster and Winkler, uh, two students of Efros in 99, established that this is really the dual category. So the, the category is dual to operator systems is really the category of of matrix convex sets. And uh, so this is happening sort of on the geometric side. Meanwhile, on the, on the operator system side or the C-star algebraic side, uh, Arvison was able to finally establish his conjecture about the existence of the Choquet boundary of a non-commutative operator system. And uh, so he did this in the separable case. And a little while later, uh, Ken Davidson and I established this in, in complete generality. Okay, so, so this is sort of the state of the art around 1998, 1999, uh, up, up to Arvison's uh, result from 2007, his JAMS paper, where he proved the existence of the Choquet boundary. Since then, there's really just been an explosion of, of uh, things happening in this area. So on the one hand, we're getting now very, very interesting examples coming from, from geometry, so specifically, non-commutative real algebraic geometry from people like Bill Helton and uh, Scott McCullough, and, and there are too many people to name now. Um, but there are, you know, sort of coming out of this work is the realization that there are some drawbacks to this, to this framework. And a big one is that on the geometric side, we all know that for a compact convex set, one of the main uh, sort of useful notions is that of an extreme point. And, and you can prove that there's not really any good notion of extreme point for a matrix convex set. Um, 
So what I'd like to talk about today is a way of repairing this issue, which leads in my opinion to a whole bunch of, of interesting mathematics. And so specifically, I'm gonna introduce non-commutative convexity. This is something I've been developing over the last few years with, with a bunch of different co-authors. Um, I wanna relate this to the theory of operator systems. And then I wanna talk about some non-commutative function theory, non-commutative Choquet theory. And finally, I'm gonna talk about some applications, including the Drury Arvison space. And actually it turns out that there are some very interesting connections to Drury Arvison space. And I can tell you that uh, my motivation for working on this in the first place really comes from Drury Arvison space and, and specifically from uh, the Arvison Douglas conjecture about essential normality. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that at the end. So let me, let me back up a little bit and talk about this classical dual equivalence of categories between compact convex sets and, and function systems. So uh, the, the model is motivated by this result from the basic theory of classical commutative C-star algebras, which says that unital commutative C-star algebras equipped with unital star homomorphisms, these are categorically equivalent or categorically dual to compact host of spaces equipped with, uh, with morphisms being continuous maps. So, there, so this is essentially saying that if you're studying one, you're also studying the other and they're, they're, they're equivalent. Um, anything you can do on one side, you can do on the other side. Now, we'd like to replace compact convex, or sorry, we'd like to replace compact uh, host of spaces with compact convex sets and somehow take into account the convex structure and identify what the dual category is there. And, and so it turns out that the right notion is, is this notion of function system. So this is a closed unital subspace, self-joint subspace of a commutative C-star algebra. And Cadison proved in 1951 that this really is the dual, uh, these, the, the category of function systems is really the dual category to the category of compact convex sets. And uh, the, the isomorphism or the, the dual equivalence goes through the state space of the function system. So because you're self-adjoint and unital, you can make sense of, uh, of order. That means you can talk about positivity and you can talk about uh, a mapping unital and you can make sense of the notion of a state. And so it makes sense to talk about the state space. And the map between the, the so, so it's from a function system to its dual, it just takes the function system to its state space. And from a compact convex set, you map to the set of continuous affine functions on a compact convex set. Okay, so this implements this dual equivalence. And this perspective is, is a big piece of the motivation for the notion of a non-commutative convex set. So now we're in the, in the non-commutative context, which means we're considering unital self-adjoint subspaces of potentially non-commutative C-star algebras. And here we can talk about the non-commutative state space. So this is the space of all unital completely positive maps from our operator system into the, the space of matrices uh, of, of given sizes. So by the way, that A there should be an S. So a unital completely positive map from S into MN. And a distinction that is uh, at this point seems fairly minor, but actually turns out to be important is I wanna consider for each n, including uh, when n is infinite. So I, I wanna allow infinite cardinal numbers here. And in that case, I'm gonna think of, for example, m infinity, I, I wanna, really what I mean by that is I mean the this space of bounded operators on a Hilbert space of dimension uh, infinity, for example, but more generally dimension n. And uh, so this, this is, turns out to be the right, non-commutative analog of the state space. And so what this is, is this is really a, a graded set of compact convex sets because each of these individual spaces for each N is compact in the point weak star topology, but it's really the relationship between these different spaces and, and the structure that, that this gives you that turns out to be the, the key thing to consider. Um, so, for the case of matrix convexity, there you're not interested in uh, in n greater than in, in infinite 
and um, I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit. But. So as I said, each of these KNs is compact and actually they're also, not only are they convex on each level, but they're convex in a non-commutative sense. Specifically, you can take non-commutative convex combinations by which I mean, you take points and instead of applying scalars that add up to one, you're allowed to apply matrix coefficients that add up to one in an appropriate sense. And this means that you can go from one level to another level in a convex combination. And this expresses the relationship between each of the different levels. So this ties together the, the graded sets that you get from, from this construction. And this is the, this is the prototypical example of a non-commutative convex set. So more generally, to define abstractly what a non-commutative convex set is, you, as I said, you're inspired by this example on the last slide. And what you do is you just write down these, basically these axioms, you write down a more general setting. So um, an NC convex set is, uh, so each level you can view as, as being a subset of matrices over an operator space. And uh, they're, they're all tied together by these, by being allowed to take these non-commutative convex combinations that I mentioned. Uh, we also want to consider a notion of compactness. It turns out the right thing to do here is just to specify that each individual level is compact in an appropriate topology. So what we're going to see is that every compact NC convex set is actually of the form uh, I, I specified in my last slide. And I, I, I think a nice example, especially if, if you're sort of canonical example of a uh, of an ordinary compact convex set is something like the, the unit ball. Uh, th this is sort of a non, the, the most natural, in my opinion, non-commutative example. So it's called the NCD ball. And this is exactly the domain that people doing non-commutative analytic function theory often consider. So this is the set of all tuples, D tuples of, of operators of an appropriate size where the row norm is, is, is contracted. So the row norm is dominated by one. Um, and it turns out that if, if you take, so there's a, a way to realize this compact com NC convex set as this NC state space of a, an operator system. So specifically, I can take the, what's called the Kuntz operator system. So this is just the operator system spanned by the canonical generators of the Kuntz algebra and as that this, uh, this NC convex set is exactly the NC state space of this operator system. So what this demonstrates is, is, or suggests at least, is that whenever I have a compact NC convex set, we should expect that there's an operator system uh, with, with this NC convex set as this NC state space. And uh, we'll see that this holds in complete generality. Okay. So the, the distinction between what I'm doing here, what I've done so far with this notion of NC convexity and matrix convexity, it's actually very small and very subtle. It's subtle. It's this idea that you should be considering points at infinity rather than sort of only points at finite levels. Okay. Um, so this is an important point for bookkeeping purposes, but the real distinction between non-commutative convexity and, and matrix convexity comes when you start to consider functions on non-commutative convex sets. So I want to introduce the notion of non-commutative function, which is very much analogous to the notion of an NC analytic function. In the category of convex sets, classical convex sets, when we're interested in talking about things like convex functions, we're interested in continuous functions. Okay, so here, what we really want to consider are continuous non-commutative functions. And uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna observe that if I have an operator system S with NC state space K, then every element in S can be viewed as a, as a function on K in a very natural way. Simply remember each point in K is, is a UCP map into matrices of appropriate size. And the way we view an element A in our operator system as a function is we simply evaluate on that point in the standard way. 
And if we, if we look at this function for a little while, we realize it satisfies the following properties. So first of all, it, it's graded in the sense that uh, points that are in, in, on, on the nth level all get mapped into MN. It respects direct sums and it's, it's equivariant with respect to isometries in the sense that uh, it commutes with, with isometries. I can apply them on the inside it's the same as, as applying them on the outside, where by applying, I mean conjugating. And so like before, this, this motivates. So, so what we expect to be happening here is we expect that this duality that I mentioned earlier in the classical case, we should have an analog of that here, where the, so what we expect is that the operator system should really be identified with the space of non-commutative affine functions on my, my compact, NC convex set. And um, so we define abstractly a, an affine NC function to be one that satisfies the axiom that I wrote down on the previous slide. Um, now I wanna, I wanna say something here. We also wanna consider functions that may not be affine. And it turns out that the distinction between affine functions and more just general NC functions has to do with this equivariance condition. So this is, very much analogous to uh, in, in the setting of non-commutative affine functions, they, they often talk about similarity. Here, a similarity with respect to arbitrary operators. Here, we, we really wanna make the distinction between unitaries and isometries. So it turns out that the right notion of non-commutative function, not necessarily affine, is to require um, unitary equivariance. If we want to consider affine functions, then we need the stronger condition of, of in equivariance with respect to isometries. What this is really saying is that the affine functions are the functions that respect non-commutative convex combinations, um, where non-commutative functions are, are simply required to respect unitary equivalence. Okay. So as I said, this is really this is analogous to, to the notion of an NC polymorphic function on a non-commutative domain that was considered first by Taylor and later by Bukulescu and now has become a, a big part of non-commutative function theory. Okay. So because we have this notion of non-commutative function, we can consider continuous NC functions. And it turns out that this forms a nice C-star algebra. We can also consider the affine, the continuous affine functions on K. And this is an operator subsystem of the C star algebra C of K. Um, and the elements in C of K are all uniform limits of non-commutative star polynomials in A of K. So what do I mean by that exactly? Well, uh, so if I have three non-commutative affine functions, say A1, A2, A3, I can consider the, the non-commutative polynomial and, and I mean star polynomial here uh, that, I wrote, that I have on this slide. And the way that we evaluate this polynomial at a point is we, we do the obvious thing. So every time we say A1, we plug in A1 of X. Everywhere we say A2, we plug in A2 of X. And we, we multiply things together in a non-commutative way. <clears throat> so our C stars with C of K is really, the, as I said, the, the limit or elements in there are limits of polynomials of this form. And um, there, there are, is a nice identification of this space of continuous functions. Um, and it's, it's, uh, has this nice sort of functorial characterization. It satisfies universal property. All of these things are analogous to what happens in the classical commutative case. And, uh, and actually it's a fairly, this, this identification is a fairly deep result. I, I don't wanna dwell on it too much at this point. The, the point I really wanna get to is, is that with these definitions, Every unital operator system is actually unitally completely order isomorphic to an operator system of the form A of K. So consisting of continuous affine functions on some compact NC convex set, namely its NC state space. So we can view every operator system in this way. And this tells us that whenever we wanna study an operator system, what we, what we may wanna do is identify its NC state space and we have the, the option of either studying this through sort of C star algebra theory or on the flip side, 
on, we can study things geometrically. Yeah. And, and this duality turns out to actually be quite useful. So, um, right. I'll just very quickly say something that I found a little bit surprising. So, so last year, um, this very interesting paper of Holin Kahn and, and uh, Van Swilikum appeared in non-commutative geometry where they, they realized that they, they needed to use non-unital operator systems in order to do some non-commutative geometry. And it occurred to, to me and, and some of my, a couple of my students that it'd be very interesting to work out the, the dual theory uh, of, of potentially non-unital operator systems. So what, in other words, is the dual geometric object in that case. And what we were surprised to learn is that this hadn't actually even been worked out in the commutative, in the classical commutative setting. And uh, it turns out that the right thing to do there is to consider the, the quasi-state space of the, uh, of the operator system. So this is the set of all uh, completely contractive, completely positive maps. Um, and what you want to consider are, are pairs consisting of, so, so if I take my quasi-state space and I also include the, the zero point, so I have two pieces of data, it turns out that this, these two pieces of data are exactly dual to the non-unital operator systems that were, were being considered by uh, uh, a non-commutative geometry. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I just want to say that everything works as well in the non-commutative or in the non-unital setting. Uh, where things start to get very interesting, I think, and now uh, there's this connection being made back to, to Arvison's work, is and 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 by the way, this motivates. Or this is entirely the original motivation for considering uh, allowing for points at infinity is that in this context, there's a very nice and robust notion of extreme point for a compact density convex set. So specifically, it turns out that every compact density convex set is the closed density convex hull of its extreme points. So there's a non-commutative prime Milman theorem here, and we can describe extreme points so there is a, a, a geometric description, but in this context, I think it makes the, the most sense probably to just say that extreme points are dual to Arvison's notion of a boundary representation. They're exactly the same thing. It's just that we're viewing them from the, from the geometric perspective, whereas Arvison was considering them from the operator system perspective. But they turn out to be the, the, the same thing here. Um, now, of course, the, the proof of extreme points was, or dually proof of boundary representations, existence of boundary representations. This was a, a, an open problem for a long time. Um, I already mentioned that Arvison established their existence in the separable case in 07, and Ken and I gave a, a proof in, in 2015, which uh, in some sense is fairly elementary. It's using ideas from, uh, from the theory of completely positive maps. Well, in our work in non-commutative convexity, Ken and I are able to give a, a very conceptual proof of the existence of boundary representations, really making use of, of uh, the non-commutative convexity. So I just wanted to advertise that because I'm not, I'm not sure that people are, are, are yet aware that this exists. Um, so if we go back to, um, to, to say a little bit more about extreme points, if we go back to this example of the non-commutative D-ball, so remember, this is the state space or the NC space, state space of the Kuntz operator system. Then the extreme points here are exactly the irreducible Kuntz isometries. Equivalently, these are the, the generators of irreducible representations of the Kuntz algebra. And the point is that these extreme points, they live, because the Kuntz algebra is simple and infinite dimensional, it has no finite dimensional representations. So these extreme points necessarily live at infinity. So you won't see these if you're just using matrix convexity. Okay. And in general, for an arbitrary operator system, the extreme points of the NC state space, they're always a subset of the, of, of the C star algebra generated by S. Actually here, I mean the, the minimal C star algebra generated by S or the C star envelope gen generated by S. But in general, they may be a very, very complicated subset 
of these irreducible representations. And I'm going to say a little bit more about this in the context of, of the Jory Arvison space, because here in particular, things, things become very interesting, I think. Okay. Now I want to just touch on some, some uh, Choquet theory and, and some non-commutative Choquet theory, because uh, this is related to the, the theme, I think, of the, the workshop. So let me give you a very brief overview of classical Choquet theory. To me, classical Choquet theory is really this, it's about the relationship between a compact convex set, its corresponding function system of continuous uh, affine functions, and the C-star algebra generated by these continuous affine functions. And it's the relationship between these three objects that to me really is what Choquet theory is about. Um, so to, to set some terminology, if I have a compact convex set C, so I'm gonna use C here to distinguish from the non-commutative case, then a prob probability measure is said to represent a point X in C, if when I restrict that probability measure to the continuous affine functions, uh, it's just the point evaluation at X. And this is equivalent to saying that the point X can be integrated against this probability measure mu, uh, which you should really think of as writing X as a convex combination of the points Y, because the probability measure is in some sense, uh, well, a, a very real, real sense, generalization of a convex combination, right? So in, in particular, every, compact, um, every uh, finite convex combination can be expressed in terms of a, a probability measure with finite support. And what Choquet in, in, in this metrizable case and Bishop and Delu more generally proved is that for any compact convex set in any point X in the, in the set, I can always find a probability measure on C that represents X in the sense that I mentioned and is maximal in what's called the Choquet order. So the Choquet order is determined by the order structure of convex functions in the C star algebra on, of continuous functions on C. So we say that one probability measure is dominated by another in this order if whenever I evaluate it, which by that I mean I integrate against uh, a convex function f, then I get this domination of, uh, of these integrals. And it turns out that, that this sort of order theoretic, uh, in a sense, C-star algebra, algebraic condition characterizes when our probability measure is supported on the boundary of our compact convex set. And so specifically, if I, if I take a maximal, a, a probability measure that's maximal in this order, then its support in an appropriate sense is contained in the boundary of the, of the set. And what that's saying is that I can write in an appropriate infinite dimensional sense, I can write every point as a convex combination of extreme points. Okay? Or in other words, I can, I can write as an integral over extreme points. So this is a very uh, high power generalization of Kerr Tidor's theorem in finite dimensions, which, which says that every compact convex set in Rn, every point in that set can be written as a, as a convex combination of extreme points. And this is a very powerful result. Um, if, I mean, a perfect example, I'm, I'm teaching a course on ergodic theory this semester, and one of the things I needed was the ergodic decomposition theorem. And in almost every book on ergodic theory, there's this very complicated proof of the ergodic decomposition, which uh, goes back to you know, the 1920s or something like that. And it's, very, it's typically very difficult and, and in a sense, very ad hoc. But if you know some Choquet theory, you realize that the ergodic decomposition theorem is a very easy application of Choquet theory. And you can essentially do it in paragraph okay, as opposed to an entire chapter. So I, I like to point that out. So let me, let me talk about one of my favorite applications of Choquet theory um, is, is a classification or way of classifying compact convex sets 
So it turns out that there's a very interesting class of compact convex set called simplices. Probably everyone is familiar with what an n simplex is. Um, I'll, I'll show you a picture of an n simplex in a second. But from a Choquet theoretic perspective, a simplex is a compact convex set with the property that every point has a unique representing probability measure that's, that is maximal. And remember, we have this, this Choquet order, and what, what uh, Choquet's theorem and Bishop Deleuze's theorem says is that every point has a maximal representing measure. A simplex is, is a compact comic set where that, there's a unique such measure, which in general, you may not have uniqueness. And this is exactly saying, intuitively at least, that C is a simplex if every point can be expressed as a convex combination of extreme points and that this, this expression is actually unique. Okay. So in R2, this is a characterization of triangles. And so I, I really think that uh, a simplex is really a sort of a, a higher dimensional generalization of the notion of a triangle. So for example, I'm, I already mentioned Kier Theodore's theorem. Um, which says that they're, so stating in terms of measures, says that I can find a finally supported Choquet maximal representing measure. That's just saying I can find a convex combination of extreme points. Uh, and for triangles, this expression is unique. So this is exactly saying that triangles are the, are the simplices or Choquet simplices in, in R2. And more generally, uh, you get, N simplices. So in, in R3, these are the tetrahedrons. In R1, they're the lines. In R0, they're the points. Okay. And there's, there are two nice applications that I want to mention. First of all, you can characterize commutative C star algebras in terms of their, uh, in terms of compact convex sets. So you ask the question, when is a compact convex set the state space of a commutative C star algebra? And the answer is exactly when it's a Bauer simplex, which means it's a simplex with closed extreme boundary. And so for example, uh, the D simplex, it's, it's a fact that this is unique up to affine homeomorphism. And this is equivalent to saying that there's a unique commutative C star algebra of dimension D plus one. Okay. And this is of course the C star algebra C to the power of D plus one. And uh, this is really, in a sense, just the Reese representation theorem in disguise because the space of probability measures is a Bauer simplex and every Bauer simplex is actually of this form. So in a sense, Bauer's theorem is really a, a sort of souped up version of Gelfand's representation theorem. Um, so another application I want to very quickly mention is, is a group theoretic dynamical characterization of property T groups. And so I, I won't bother describing property T groups, except to say that having property T is in a sense, the opposite of being amenable. If you're amenable and you have property T, then you're, you're finite, which in a sense means you're trivial as a group. And a group has property T, this is a very nice result of Glasner and Weiss. Uh, if and only if, whenever you consider a compact G action or a flow, the set of invariant probability measures in that flow is a Bauer simplex. And uh, so this is equivalent to the statement that whenever my property T group, or whenever my group rather acts on a commutative C star algebra, the set of invariant states is the state space of another commutative C star algebra. Okay. Now, in the non-commutative setting, it turns out that there's a very nice, uh, version of Choquet theory. Essentially, uh, in my opinion, I think I'm, I'm allowed to say this, uh, the majority, the vast majority of the interesting results in Choquet theory seem to go through in the non-commutative setting. And I mentioned earlier that to, to me, at least the big sort of reason for considering, for working in the context of non-commutative convex sets is not just because they, they provide this 
advantage over matrix convex sets where you get extreme points, although I do think that's important. The important thing here is really that you, you can use this as, as the foundation for a very nice theory of non-commutative functions, which you can then build this, this non-commutative show K theory on. Um, for example, if you wanted to find a notion of continuity, there are functions, non-commutative functions that may be continuous in every finite level, but discontinuous at, at the infinite level. So you, you can't get at this theory unless you're willing to, to work with infinite uh, points at infinity. And <clears throat> so there's a natural notion of, of convexity for, for an NC function, simply because there's a natural notion of epigraph or points above the graph of the function. And just like for ordinary convexity, we say that a function, an NC function is convex if its epigraph is NC convex. Uh, and you can express this as this kind of Jensen inequality type condition. Uh, and let, let, me, let me give an example of what uh, convex NC functions look like. So if I fix an interval in the real numbers, I consider that the, the NC convex set of matrices, say alpha, or more, more generally operators alpha with spectrum in the interval. This is a compact NC convex set. The first level is the interval I. Uh, a self-adjoint function is convex as an NC function, if and only if the restriction to the first level is operator convex. So operator convex means that it's convex when you plug in matrices or operators in, in the, as in the expression here. So this is, a, this is actually a classical notion, this notion of operator convexity. And, uh, and what we see here is that this, for this special case when, when uh, by the way, I'll mention that I here, the interval is a, is a simplex. And uh, it's a fact that when you have a simplex, the, uh, your choice of K is, is actually very constrained. But what this says is that uh, these, this NC convexity in this very special case is actually a equivalent to operator convexity. So more generally, NC can, this, this NC or convexity of NC functions is a, is a generalization of this notion of operator convexity. What I just explained to you, this is essentially uh, what's called the hansen pedersen jensen inequality for operator convex functions. So just like in the classical case, we can say that uh, an NC state represents a point in K. If when I restrict that point to the affine functions on K, NC affine functions on K, I just get point evaluation at, at the point X. Okay, so equivalently, mu evaluated at A is, is A of X. Remember mu is, uh, so an NC state, remember this is a UCP map from C of K into MN. And uh, so it turns out that there's a, there's a natural notion of, of uh, non-commutative show K order using this non-commutative notion of convexity, just like in the classical case, except we replace convex with, with non-commutative convex. And every point has a representing state that is maximal in this order. And this is exactly, we get the exact same kind of conclusion here that the support of this state is actually contained in the boundary in an appropriate sense. So this is the, the non-commutative analog of saying that every point can be expressed in terms of extreme points, convex combinations, but in this case, NC, convex combinations of extreme points. Um, and we get a nice integral representation theorem that says that Basically, we take the previous results and we, we do some deep disintegration theory or decomposition theory of maps. And we can express uh, every, so evaluation at, at any point, we can express as an integral against uh, evaluation of points that are extreme points. So this is, this is actually sort of an alternative presentation in a sense of, of the disintegration theory from uh, or direct integral theory, uh, which is closer to, to the classical show K theory. Okay. 
I'm going to skip over the technical details there, although I, although I think it's very interesting. It's not what I want to emphasize today. I want to mention this notion of a non commutative showcase simplex, which tells us that we're able to do some classification of NC convex sets and consequently some classification of operator systems. So just like in the classical case, we say that an, uh, an NC convex set K, compact NC convex set K is a simplex or showcase simplex if each point has a unique maximal representing state, maximal in this NC showcase order. And as I mentioned, this is saying essentially that every point can be uniquely expressed in terms of extreme points. And this is a true generalization of the classical notion of simplex, because if you have a classical simplex, then there's a unique non-commutative simplex with that simplex as its first level. And we, we have some nice sort of operator system theoretic characterizations of, of what it means to be an NC showcase simplex. It turns out to be equivalent to the property that the bidual of the corresponding operator system is actually a von Neumann algebra, okay? Uh, so this was a notion that was introduced by Kirchberg and Wasserman in a different context, actually in the context of classification theory of C-star algebras. So they considered what they called C-star systems. And C-star system is exactly uh, an operator system with the property that it's bidual is a von Neumann algebra. <clears throat> There's also uh, this, this tensor product characterization. So classically, there's a tensor product characterization of classical syntheses, which, which, which is in terms of, uh, well, they're, they're, exact, they're exactly the nuclear function systems in an appropriate sense. And this is a, an analog of that, although the, the condition here is more complicated because we need to consider a sort of souped up version of, uh, not, not souped up, more, uh, well, more complicated version of nuclearity. <clears throat> so this immediately tells us that if I start, for example, with a C star algebra, because the bidule of a C star algebra, of course, is it's, it's always a von Neumann algebra. It's the universal enveloping von Neumann algebra. Um, or more generally, if the C star algebra or the, the operator system rather has something called the, the weak expectation property, which it has in particular if it's nuclear, these are all examples where the, the NC state space is going to be a simplex, it's going to be an, a non commutative simplex. And actually, we can give a, a very nice, I think, characterization of C star algebras in terms of their NC state spaces. So, uh, so if I'm given abstractly a, a compact NC convex set, I can detect whether it comes from a C star algebra. It comes from a C star algebra exactly when it's an NC simplex with closed set of extreme points. And I can even do this in the non-unital case if I'm willing to use this, this sort of non-unital technology I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, now there, there is, there, in the literature, there, there exists some characterizations of C star algebras using the state space of the C star algebra which is actually of importance in, in quantum theory, it's very complicated because you need to take into account not only the convex structure, but you need to take into account something called the orientation of the state space. Um, so if you're familiar with this, it's kind of interesting to compare this, this characterization. And uh, it makes me wonder, like the, the proof of this characterization is due to Alfson and Schultz. And uh, the proof is contained in a book that they wrote, which is very long, very, very difficult proof. I'd like to know if, if there's some connection uh, and if you could see this result in, from our result, for example. The second application I want to mention is an, a non commutative characterization of property T groups. So a group has property T, it turns out, if and only if whenever it acts on a C star algebra, then the set of invariant NC states is an NC Bauer simplex, which is exactly equivalent to saying, the following sort of nice C star algebraic characterization. A group has property T exactly when, whenever it acts on a C star algebra, the set of invariant states 
is the state space of another C-star algebra. So I, I'm highlighting this stuff with synthesis because I think it's one of the more uh, exciting applications so far of this theory. It's, it's already, we've, we found some, some nice applications to dynamics. Um, Anyways, I hope I, I was somewhat convincing. So now I wanna, I wanna talk about the drury arvison space because as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, much of this work was motivated by stuff that I had done on, on the drury arvison space, work that I had done with drury arvison space. And in particular, this problem of essential normality. And so just to set the stage, let's, uh, I'm gonna st steal Michael Hartz's uh, notation for the drury arvison space. So HT to the D is the drury arvison space in, in D variables. I'm gonna denote the D shift or the, or the coordinate multiplication operators by MZI. And MZ will, will be the, the row operator. So these multiply functions by the coordinates, coordinate functions. And what I'd like to do is consider the, the drury arvison operator system. So this is the span of the generators or the span of these multiplication operators and their adjoints. So this is a, I guess, a 2D plus one dimensional operator system. And I can consider its NC state space. And I can interpret a result of Arvison from his paper subalgebras three as a description of the extreme points, because remember extreme points exactly correspond to boundary representations. So Arvison identified the boundary representations of this operator system in his paper. And he showed that they're exactly the identity representation up to unitary equivalence. And the point evaluations on the boundary of the, of the D ball. So that's saying ex exactly that these are the extreme points in our language. So you get this, this is the picture that I have in my head when I think about non-commutative convex set. I think, of the, I think of them as these kind of layered objects. So on the first level, which is where all of these point evaluations live because point evaluations by, uh, by definition, they, they map to points in the complex plane. So these live on the first level, whereas the identity representation, and by the way, by this, I mean the identity representation, uh, by this, I just mean the identity representation of the C-star algebra generated by the multipliers on the drury arvison space. Um, restricted, of course, to the, to the operator system. And so this lives at the at level infinity. And everything in between in this NC convex set is a non-commutative convex combination of points on the first level or points at the on the infinite level or the infinite level, namely uh, unitary equivalence classes of the identity representation. So every single point can be expressed in terms of these points, is what this says. Um, so now let's consider an ideal of, of C to the Z or, or C to the Z1 to ZD. And I want to consider the closure, say M, in the jury Arvison space. So this is in the, in the language of Arvison. Uh, this is a, a finally generated CZ module or Hilbert module, where the module action is defined by the action of um, Right, so it's, a, it's defined by the, by the multipliers on the jury arvison space. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to compress, I'd like to consider the compression of, of this, um, of the multipliers to the complement of this, of this module, which is equivalent to saying that this is a, an invariant subspace for the D shift. So I'd like to consider the compression to the complement. So this is the, an important setting in, when you're considering the problem of essential normality, you'd like to show that this compression, this detuple I get by compressing, that this is actually essentially normal in the sense that uh, the SIs commute with the SI stars uh, modulo the compacts. And I want to consider the operator system spanned by these compressions. And I want to let L denote the NC state space of, of this operator system. So results that, that Orr and I proved in 2015 can be, 
it really is, is giving a description of the extreme points of L. But actually, it's not a precise description. It's just saying that the extreme points are contained in the following set. So they're contained in the set of unitary equivalence classes of the identity representation, along with the intersection, closure of the intersection of the, the zeros of the ideal and the boundary of the D-ball. Okay? This is where the extreme points live. But we weren't able to show that this is always an equality. And this is the question I'd like to raise. And I claim that this, this question has potentially some important implications and I'll explain my motivation for asking this question. So what I'm really asking here are, is, is the following, is every point evaluation, we know that the identity is, is a boundary representation. Okay? This is a result or and I proved, um, it, or it's at least implicit in our, in our paper. And I'm asking if each of these point evaluations is also boundary representation. So here's my motivation. Um, this module M, so, so Orin, I proved that this, this module M is essentially normal if and only if the operator system that I just wrote down is what's called hyper rigid. And this is equivalent to the statement that whenever I take a representation of the C star algebra generates, then the restriction to S has a unique representation, has a unique extension to a UCP map. And since, of course, since the representation is UCP, this must necessarily be the, the unique extension. Okay. And hyper rigidity implies, would imply equality in, in the last equation. So a negative answer to this question that I'm asking would therefore provide a counterexample to the, the Arvison Douglas essential normality conjecture. On the other hand, a positive answer combined with a counterexample to essential normality would actually provide a counterexample to another conjecture of Arvison, which is Arvison's uh, hyperrigidity conjecture. So his hyperrigidity conjecture asks if whenever every Udis representation is a boundary representation, or in our language is an extreme point of the NC convex, the NC state space, does that imply hyperrigidity, which is this unique extension property? So this almost looks like a dichotomy. Uh, of course, it could be the case that both of these conjectures are true, uh, in which case you, you wouldn't get anything from this, but uh, more generally, I, I think the there's some interesting geometry going on here. One question I have is what happens for, for modules that are not necessarily finitely generated? What does the geometry look like there? So what are the, what are the boundary representations and, and so on and so forth? Um, and also you can consider this question in a non-commutative setting. So in the, uh, in the setting of the, the non-commutative analytic functions on the D-ball or equivalently on the, on the full Fox space, um, when you take ideals there and you take compressions in this way, what are, the, what are the boundary representations? This should be an isomorphism invariant. And even for people working in, in algebra, like in, in non-commutative algebraic geometry, they're very interested in when quotients of the free associative algebra, for example, are isomorphic. And these, these boundary representations are really invariants for, for these kinds of uh, isomorphism, for, for these kinds of questions. So I think, I think as, as people working in, in operator algebras or, or uh, analytic function theory, I, I think we actually have some tools that, that could potentially be of interest to people working in these other areas. Okay, and I'm gonna stop here. So thank you for, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Go on. Uh, Matt, I, I have a question about your your stuff with or Arvison's uh, essential normality conjecture has to do with homogeneous varieties and That's homogeneous right. modules. Is your theorem, but you didn't mention that. So is your theorem valid in for all varieties? Yeah, so so not not every single result in our paper holds for general varieties, 
but our, our results that I stated here do. So I don't require the assumption, in other words, of, of homogeneity, just the finitely generated property. Other questions? Uh, if not, then let's <clears throat> thank our speaker again. Okay. And, uh, we'll see you 